my name is Ben Marshall and I've been with Radio Parts for a number of years now and for some reason or another I've become one of our CCTV guys, our go-to ones to try and work out what's going on with it. We have a number of others, plenty of people who know their way around it to a pretty decent level and there is a huge amount of information that I'm nowhere near going to be able to fit in today in terms of every little setup, in terms of every little option. Uh, I had the plan of finishing off the full uh, updated manual for you all today and to present it and be you know roundly I don't know praised for a wonderful job but unfortunately no I haven't got that far um, a few other things have gotten in the way over the last couple of weeks so that's not ready to go yet uh, essentially the idea is that it'll have screenshots they'll be clickable so that you can go through to each different item that's on there and go oh that's how the motion detection works or that's what UPnP means or DHCP on this equals that for today though, I'm going to try and go through some of the basic setup options, more or less focused on the things that go wrong for people and why stuff doesn't work the way that you expect it to. Um, and to do that, I have to start with the number one thing that causes issues when it comes to CCTV and that is networking and IP technology. So um, I was going to ask, does anybody have a good definition of what IP means? but I'm not sure there is any really good way of understanding what it is without doing some of the technical side. So my typical example has always been things like uh, desks in an office or network, uh, let's say phone extensions, you know, within a building. But I'm gonna take it a little bit differently this way and say, we're gonna talk about caravan parks this time. So in a caravan park, you have a number of sites they're all labelled, say, 0 or 1 through to 254, because let's say that's what it is. Now we've got five theoretical caravan parks right next to each other down the beach, and each of them has a different starting point or a different subnet to make it work. In other words, berth number 47 in here isn't the same as berth 47 in here, and you can't talk from one to the other because there's big gates and Dobermans, you know, and everything else that are blocking you from going from one to the other. So... Let's take that example and now translate it to this. So what we're looking at here is my modem router. My modem router is sitting at an IP address, internal IP address of 192.168.0.1. Now, this is my caravan park information. This is, say, the town where it is. This is the street where it is. And that's the address on the street where my caravan parks are located. So this one is the first cab off the rank, it's number zero. Within that, it can tell every other device that's in this network where to go. You know, so it's the person at the front desk handing out tickets and your free Wi-Fi access and whatever else and saying, you're on site number 73. Great, simple. Anything that's in here that wants to talk to anything else has to talk through that last number. And that means that I can walk from site number 47 to 123 and talk to the people that are there. I can walk from another site to another one, another one to another one, and it all works really, really simply. When I'm within that same subnet, and subnet in this case is this zero part of it. Anything within 192.168.0 talks to anything else within 192.168.0. Great, simple, right? That would be fine if every bot device in every network always came out of the box with its default app uh, addresses to be that, but they don't. Ours specifically do not do it that way because they can cause problems if they're on a network and they're not configured properly. Plug it into somebody's network that's not ready for it and you'll knock out the internet, VoIP, uh, pacemakers that are connected to it. It could be all sorts of things that have issues there. So we set all of these with static IP addresses to start off with. And your job when you sell these or when you use them is to adjust that to match your network settings, not the other way around, okay? So let's start by having a bit of a look at my network. I have got well, basically that exact configuration set up here. I have my modem router sitting underneath. I have a data cable running from the modem router to my 16 channel recorder, which is the bottom of the stack. I have another cable running to an eight port PoE switch, but I'm not using the PoE side. And I have that running into an 8-channel hybrid, and I have it running into an 8-channel 4K NVR. I have another cable out of my modem router running into my DOS PoE switch. And then this one I've got running, uh, what is it, seven cameras off that switch. 
So they range from a UniView camera, Vision, NVU, Nest cameras, all through a range of DOS cameras as well. All connected up to it. Some of them are defaulted, other ones have already been accessed in the first session, so they have IP addresses already. This is my very basic network configuration. Do not come behind here and have a look at the cabling. It mirrors that, but it's a lot worse. It's a lot messier. Um, at the moment, if I want this camera to talk to this NVR, does anybody know, does the router need to be involved in that process, or can this just talk straight to that? Any ideas? Yes or no? Got yes at the back. Mikey thinks yes. Sorry, you're wrong. It does need the router to get involved. The router routes the traffic around the network. So your modem acts as a modem, talks to the outside world. It acts as a router, routes all the traffic inside your network. And it also acts as a wireless access point in most cases. We're ignoring that for simplicity today. But if this camera wants to talk to this recorder, in theory, they're through the same switch, right? They should just be able to talk from there to there. But that's not how our routing, that's not how routing works. Goes back up through here to here, back down to here. Same thing when you're sending commands back and down the opposite direction. So if your router's not in the system, if your IP addresses are wrong, if your subnets are wrong or anything else, that communication doesn't work or that one doesn't work or that one doesn't work as you go through it all. So making sure that everything is in the same IP subnet is a really, really important thing. Now, there's one thing I haven't sort of gone into and it's probably beyond the scope for today, but there's a technology called VLANing. So if you have a really good IP network and you know what you're doing, you've got managed switches and routers and everything else that can handle it, it's possible to chuck all of your camera traffic and your NVRs on a separate virtual part of your network with a different subnet, a different address and all that sort of stuff. You've borrowed a tunnel from one side of your caravan park to the next caravan park next door. But your router is the only thing that really talks to it properly unless you configure it. There is one little odd thing about some of our NVRs in that they also have the ability to do that through their external ports. So I was going to show it through here, but I think it'll be easier just to go straight across the NVR and show you that instead. So what am I on here? Uh, I think this should be here. I might have to. Yeah, my little recorder is having a fun day today, which might means I need to do this separately later on. Purple screens, lovely. Switch that. In fact, this is going to be the wrong one. Do that. Don't watch me unplugging and replugging HDMI cables live. That is definitely not something you should do in practice because you can kill HDMI sockets and cause all kinds of problems. So, do this. And now it should actually look right. Okay, so this is the 8 channel 4K NVR, which is this beast here in the pile. This particular NVR, just going to log into it. This is if, if your first time using one of these things, default passwords in the paperwork, but it's 888888 for these ones at least. There is a guide that comes up for it. In the guide, you can set your output resolution. You can set your LAN details. So you can see this is set to a default uh, its default IP address on the network. That won't work with my modem, because remember my modem's .0.1, so I can change it here, so I'm going to. I'll go through and I'm going to go dot zero dot, uh, let's say 125. And I'm going to set this down the bottom to dot zero dot one. Okay, one little thing on that page. There's a little checkbox called DHCP. As a very, very rough guide, this is the person in the front desk at the caravan park who tells you what site you're going to. Their job is to fill up site after site, you know, one after the other, all the way through the network. Their job is pretty simple. They don't really care who it is, what device it is. All they do is just fire the, you know, your number seven in the rank, so you're going to go site seven, or you're going to go to 35 or whatever else it is that's there. DHCP is great if you're a mobile phone, a tablet, a you know, smart TV or something similar. Smart TVs maybe not, but it means that it's really simple setup. You plug in your modem router, you put in your password and details from your ISP, you set your network name as pretty fly for a white guy, Wi-Fi or whatever it is you want to do, 
password into it, and then all you do is connect via your phone and put your password in, that's it. System's done, you're online, and you're viewing the internet. With devices like these, if you put DHCP in here, it'll talk to the modem, the modem will assign it an IP address, everything's fine until something changes. Another device comes on the network, the power goes down, comes back up, and now it's changed its IP address. It might have stacked it in a new place somewhere else on the network, and now it can't talk to the cameras anymore. So I tend to recommend not using DHCP unless you're on a really simple network and you know exactly what you're doing to control it from there, okay? Knowing what your network has, what other devices are on your network, and then setting an IP address that works is a much, much safer way of doing it, particularly if you're doing this for your customers who don't want to have to ever think about this and will call you at the drop of the hat if you get it wrong. So I normally set a manual IP address for it. My next page that's here, I have my codes, and that's it. Job's done. Now, I wanted to talk to you, I was talking to you about VLANs before. And this is where it comes in. So in my network settings, on this particular recorder, I've got, there's my IP address, I've set a static one, there's my gateway, I've got DNSs and all this other stuff, right? But there's this weird bit at the top that if I click that, there's LAN 2. So the easiest way I have of describing this is some of our NBRs, not all of them, but most of them, have a separate card for the PoE ports that are built into it as opposed to anything else that it might pick up from the rest of the network. So the way that works is anything that's plugged directly into the back of the NVR itself is going to be on this IP address subnet. And you can probably really hard to see, but that's 192.168.2.189 is the default IP address of this device. If I plug in a camera to the back of this one, I need to set it and configure it to be on that same IP address range as my NVR's second port. The huge benefit this has for us is it isolates the traffic. So if I have eight cameras plugged into the back of this unit, I'm just plugging in a demo one at the back here. If I have eight cameras plugged into here, each of them's producing six to 10 megabits per second worth of traffic, that's another, well, 80 odd megabits of traffic that's on your network. If you're already struggling for data or if your router is not particularly good, if it's the cheap one that's provided by your ISP, that might be enough traffic to bring down the network and cause other problems. Slow down for the internet, Netflix doesn't work properly, the kids are screaming about YouTube, etc. Enabling this to have its own little virtual LAN or its secondary network card inside means all the cameras just talk to the NVR. They don't talk to the router, they don't talk to anything else on the network because our little N our NVR is acting as the router, router. It's acting as its own little network, our own modem. So that's where our LAN 2 comes in. So if I now go to search for cameras, I'll find a whole heap of them on our network. And I can see, it's really difficult to see, but at the bottom of my list here, I've got three that are coming up as LAN 2 rather than LAN 1. My LAN 1 is all of this stuff. It's all these extra cameras. It's everything else that's on the network. This little camera, though, which is the same camera for these three here, is on my LAN 2 network. It's on my local one instead. So if I want to add this one, well, there's a couple of things I have to do. The IP address isn't right because it's not going to talk properly on LAN 2 with a .0 address. So I get to this page, I go in here, and I modify this one. I'm going to call it .2.195, because I can. My default gateway, I now need to match it. So I need to make that .2.1 instead of the other way around. And I modify it. Successful. Exit. Now, if I add this as a device, I should be able to see it. So there we are. So I've changed that IP address to match LAN 2 because I've connected to LAN 2 the ports that are on the back of the unit. So if you're doing support for somebody on this one, ask them, are they connected to the ports on the back of the NVR or are they connected via a PoE switch or to a PoE injector to the rest of the network that's there? If I add another camera to this one, and let's say I add this camera, 
This camera is on LAN 1, so it's not connected directly to the back of it. It's connected to my PoE switch and to my router and to the rest of my network. I do the same thing I did before. I check the channel box, I connect over to here, and you can see the IP address is completely different. I save that one, exit here, preview, and look, there's my other camera coming up. This is a camera that could be in another building. This would be a fiber link from a uh, building down the road to the local one. This could be a physically different you know, section of the network altogether. So it means that you've got some options in terms of how you set this thing up to make it work. Um, it also means that for the installers that are out there, if you're going to a job that has, say, four or eight cameras or 16 cameras on a site, connect up the number of cameras that you want to the back of your NVR set them, configure all the IP addresses, get them all up and running, ready to go. When you go out to site, leave LAN 2 alone, go to LAN 1, make LAN 1 match the rest of your network, because you haven't been there before, you don't know what their IP addresses are, you don't know what their modems and routers are doing. I can go in and change this manually to 15.10.5.47 if that's what the customer wants me to do. Leave all my LAN 2 stuff alone, the cameras are still talking to the NVR, they're ready to go plug the cables in, install them, fire them in the right directions, and the NVR is up and running. So five minutes worth of setup at home to get all the IP addresses right, you know, five minutes of setup on site in terms of the software for the network, that's it, job's done, sorted for you. It's just then if you can get them to pay for the time that you spend at home doing it as well, or if they pay for your professionalism on the job, or you sit there ticking boxes and unticking boxes for half an hour and get paid for that, whichever way it works for you when you're on site. I like having it all set up beforehand though because it tells me that all my cameras are working the way that I expect them to. Any settings or options or any weird tweaks that I want to do, I've done them you know, out of the customer's eyes. I haven't had to reboot, replace a camera, do anything else silly. If I plug a cable in, um, I know my camera's working, but I've made my own cable to run 25 meters up the other side of a building. If I haven't crimped that properly, at least I know my camera's working, the NVR's working, the only thing that's left is my handiwork on the cable. So that makes a huge difference too. Again, for those who are providing tech support for it, asking whether people have provided their own cabling, whether they've crimped them themselves or whether they're using patch leads for it. If they have an option just to plug it in locally to test it out and see if it works on a pre-made lead, if it works there and doesn't work up there, guess what? We know what your problem's going to be and it involves you and a crimping tool. So, very useful to know. Um, I've turned off the network disconnecting alarm here, but it may be something worthwhile doing on site as well. Um, on this page, you can see that when I did a search, I found a whole heap of cameras, but there are some of them that are, well, there's 130 there, there's 130 there. So how have I got two cameras at the same IP address? I've got a single one here, I've got a 195 sitting down there and all the rest of it. These different formats are something that we really need to cover in just a little bit of detail. So when a camera talks on a network, it talks a, a particular protocol, and that's based on the chipset that's on board, the manufacturer that made it, and everything else that goes into that system. So I think these recordings may not come out, Bill, and we're losing a few too many of them here. But. A Hikvision camera talking to a Hikvision NVR or a Uniview camera talking to a Uniview NVR or a DOS camera talking to a DOS NVR is one of the simplest things in the world because they all know each other. They were made in the same made probably within 100 metres of each other and everybody's happy about talking together. But when I introduce a Hikvision NVR to a DOS camera or I take uh, an NVU uh, you know, Nest camera and try to connect it up to one of mine, or a Bosch camera, or a Swan camera, or something else that's there. Is it possible to make it work? Most cases, yes. Some cases, bizarrely, no. If they provide the right protocols, then yes, I can make it happen. So if I have existing cameras, I can connect them up to a new NVR. If the cameras are all dead and I've got, you know, the NVR is fine, I should be able to connect up new cameras to an old NVR and an old system. The biggest things that cause problems with this, the reason why it might not work, number one is the protocols. If they're the wrong protocol, you know, let's say you've bought the cheapest insert brand name here from, I don't know, Big W, Bunnings, whatever else it is. Bought the cheapest camera system, cheapest recorder that they had. The recorder's died, you want to put a new one in. The 
biggest hurdle we have is PoE when it comes to this and an IP camera system. PoE, standard PoE is 802.3.AF or AT, which is a particular voltage, a particular protocol, particular way of talking. 48 volts, 46 to 50, you know, 55 volts at a certain wattage, but it's auto-negotiating. In other words, if I plug in a PoE device to a PoE switch and they both support the same standard, they talk to each other and say, hey, I do this, okay, I'll give you this. If you plug in a passive PoE NVR, let's say, so your brand, you know, your cheap NVR is plugged in and you plug in a camera that's not the standard one, this might be pushing 12 volts out through the power, through the ethernet cables or 24 volts or something else that's non-standard. Plug the wrong thing into the wrong thing and something will die or it just will not work. So be very, very careful when you're play, plugging them in together. If you're not sure, get the exact model of the NVR that you want to put in there, the exact model of the cameras that you want to put in there, and we need to check it and make sure that works. So let's just say now, in our theoretical situation, that PoE is a standard and that everybody uses it and it's great. And so I now want to connect my Hikvision camera to my DOS NVR. It's as simple as just plugging it into the network or into the PoE port to make it happen. Not quite. Hikvision, Enview, Dahua, a uh, whole heap of other camera manufacturers out there might support a standard called ONVIF. And ONVIF is the most universal one that goes out and about. And the way I liken this to is to, let's say, English as a language. And then there are all these dialects within English, which are the different versions of ONVIF. So ONVIF P, Q, R, S, and all the other ones that are there. But English as a standard is pretty good. Somebody from Northern Ireland should be able to talk to somebody from, let's say, America, and they'd be understand, they understand each other. They use the same basic language structure to make it work. But there might be specific things about one or the other that don't work. A term that they use in Northern Ireland that they don't use in the US, or in particular parts of the US. With a DOS NVR and a DOS camera, or a Hikvision NVR and a Hikvision camera, they will often use their own version of language. So in this case, let's call it German. And if German language has particular terms like Schadenfreude, for example, which is a great one word phrase that means a heck of a lot in English, but it's just one word. So it's very efficient, very clever, and the two things talk to each other and they understand the meaning very simply. But if you said Schadenfreude to somebody who doesn't speak German, who's never heard the word before, you've got no idea what we're talking about or anything else to do with it. So be a little bit careful about what cameras you plug into which ones. And if you want to enable OnViv or make it work, well, that's what I'm about to show you as well. So in all of these cameras, OnViv is here as a standard. If you have the options of S-Link, i8, use those instead. They are the proprietary ones that DOS works with DOS cameras and DOS NVRs. S-Link, i8, i9, i8H, and so on for it, allow you to do more things. So if I've got my S-Link cameras that are here, I've got this little OnViv one up the top here. I'll just add that in. Uh, I'll go through what the details of this one are in a minute, but uh, I think this is my, I think this is my UniView one, isn't it? Yes, it is. Okay. So there I've got my three cameras. I've got a couple of DOS ones and I've got my little five megapixel UniView one on the end here for it. I use the OnViv standard for it. With OnViv, you want to put your username and password in every time you use it. Admin and whatever the, pass, you know, whatever the default password is the standard. If you're not sure, log directly into the IP address of the camera itself or use one of their manufacturer's software tools to find it activate it and do what's there. I'll get to that in a second, but as a very basic thing, OnViv versus i8 and so on. So if I go into, all right, so this is channel one. I've got the option, because it's a DOS camera and a DOS NVR, I can pick and choose these things. I can turn off my channel name from here. I can show the time and date or turn it off. I can change the screen size and all the other stuff that's on the screen for it, save all that and the NVR is telling the camera what to do. They're communicating through German to be able to understand each other very efficiently and very well. If I change across to channel three, this is my OnViv camera. You know, same sort of basic settings are here, but there's one missing down the bottom, this lens parameters option. Go back to channel one. 
Yeah, on screen display size, who cares about that? But my lens parameters, that's where my WDR is. If I turn that on, save, fine. I turn on WDR for my camera and I get more detail and other stuff that goes into it. That camera, the Onviv one, also has WDR, but I can't set it in here. I can't choose it, can't change it, can't do anything about it. If I want to change my WDR settings for this one, I have to log into this camera specifically via its web interface, put the username and password in, go into its lens settings and turn WDR on. If I want to change its frame rate, if I want to change its internal camera name, if I want to use a very specific feature that that camera has, or I want to limit its resolution or do something else like that, I've got to log into that camera specifically to do all of those options because my NVR doesn't quite speak the same language. It's well enough to be able to see it, but not well enough to be able to tell it what to do. Does that make sense? It's a very rough thing. So anybody, again, who's selling these things, different generations of cameras from us or from anybody else might have different options and you need to be able to make them talk to each other. So use the version they all work with and if you're not getting the options you expect, go into the camera itself and you can play and tweak around to your heart's content with that. So on this network at the moment, if I switch back across to my computer and go to here, I'll go to my, this is my UniView camera. I haven't got the plugin installed at the moment for it and it's gonna tell me to change my password. Going to my setup that's on here. And you can see from here that I have a lot of options in terms of, yeah, my intelligent target thing is a thing that only works for UniView gear. My audio encoding mode, we only have one option. Maybe that's an option that works with the DOS NVRs and so on. This camera's got its own thing. It's doing its own way of, you know, working its own way. It's got an SD card on board so you can record it. This one's running off DHCP, so it's grabbing an IP address naturally. Can have its own, you know, uh, time. I've set this the other day, so that's all correct. Daylight savings times options are all in here and so on and so on. But what I mean is, here's my video. Okay, so I've got three streams coming off this one, which makes it fairly unusual. If I go to my image settings that are here, I've got my ability to switch automatically between different sw scenes. This camera has the ability to detect whether it's night or day or super bright conditions or headlights or whatever else built into it. Or I can manually set the options from here. You know, all this sort of stuff is stuff I can only do through the camera's interface itself. If I go to, excuse me, just jumping across quickly, but if I do something here, I go to one of my other cameras, one of my DOS ones. I have to set a password it's the first time I go into it. Beautiful, done. Go into here, enable flash. All these sort of settings are on our FAQs on the site. That's why I'm sort of skipping past them quickly. So this camera that's here, I have the same sort of functions and options. They're just different versions of them. So from here, I can go in, I can set my display settings. I can set my audio settings, my video parameters and everything else. So if I put my DOS camera onto a non-DOS NVR, I can log into it, I can adjust the WDR, light levels, infrared, whatever else I want to do by logging into the camera itself. Even with i8, i9, S-Link and so on for it, those options may still, uh, there may be still options in the camera that aren't available in the NVR. One big one for me is take a little camera like this one, so a little eco, uh, a little eco 8 megapixel camera. Pretty cheap, fair few options in terms of everything that's on the back of it, but it has a compact flash card slot on the board for a micro SD card in this case. If I put a micro SD card in here, I can use this as a local recording device. That could be to buffer the information so it doesn't overload the network, or if somebody comes in, takes a sledgehammer to my NVR, this is still recording. 
Now, if I've got a 128 gig stick that's in there, it's probably not going to be a lot of recording, but it's enough that I might catch the guy who came in with a crowbar and stole my NVR. And he doesn't know, he thinks he's got all the recordings that are sitting on the big box that's inside there. That recording function, though, isn't available through the NVR. You have to log into the camera directly to make that work. Okay? Cool. Sorry, I'm talking too much. My throat's getting sore. So I've sort of gone very quickly through IP address setting, two different LAN cards on some of the recorders. I've done a bit with the networking and I'm going to get into that a little bit more now because I want to talk about how you get these things onto the app so that you can view them remotely. So in a very general sense, to get something talking to another device, they need to go through some sort of connection to each other. So my mobile phone on the same network as, well, my laptop here is on the same network as this recorder. And so I can see the recorder through my laptop or I can see it directly from a HDMI cable plugged into a screen. So that's fine, they're talking together. If I want the app to work, the app on my phone, my phone has to connect to something to connect to the NVR. So if I'm within the same building, I'm connecting to my, wi uh, my modem via Wi-Fi, my modem's sending me the information from the NVR. Not a problem, I can view what's going on for it while I'm within the same network and the same building. If I'm outside of that network, my modem needs to be able to push the information out and allow the information back in from my app and my NVR so they can talk through a hole to each other. And that's what ports do and act as on your network. Manual port forwarding is a pain in the neck. You can have to do a lot of port forwarding to make it work. If you're on a good IT network, talk to the IT professional on site because they're going to know a heck of a lot more about it than you will, and they will be the ones that will be your best contact there. They'll log into the modem, they'll set up the port forwarding, they'll do everything they need to do and say to you, use these ports, bang, done. All sorted and done. If not, if you're on a home network or something simple like I've got here, simple-ish, we use a different thing called universal plug and play now. UPNP and UPNP is in my advanced settings here and there it is. So by default it comes enabled on most NVRs but if you're not getting the result you expect check in your network settings your advanced network settings typically and make sure that UPNP is enabled. Um, I have got one of the other ones on the network currently doing UPNP properly so I'll switch to my laptop and show the other part of it. What you can see here is there are five ports that this NVR is requesting from your modem. They're everything from Onviv ports to secure HDTP ports to streaming video ports and more. This is what it needs to be able to talk to your app and allow you to remotely view your cameras and your system to do playback, to control it, to do everything else you might want to do. It needs those ports to be open to make it work. So. We've enabled it in here. Let's switch to my laptop. And let's do the always fun job of logging into the modem and seeing what's going on. So here is my little TP-Link LTE modem without a SIM card at the moment. So I have no internet connection, which is fine. I've got all my stuff happening inside. I have one wireless client, which is my laptop, and I have a whole heap of wired clients. These are recorders, cameras, everything that's on the network that's there. If I go into my advanced network settings, NAT forwarding on here, there is a UPnP option. Every different modem has it in a slightly different place. Um, even within, say, the same brand, they may not be in the same section or the same gear. The thing you're looking for is this UPnP. Um, if your modem doesn't have it, if it's old enough or if there's a problem with the modem or it's just not possible, then you have to go through the manual port forwarding process to make it happen. And all those five ports that we were talking before, you have to enable each and every one of them to enable, wait, make sure that traffic works. So at the moment, I've got, let's say this NVR that's here, 122 that's going through. It's asking for a whole heap of different ports and UPnP has let it do it. And you can see there they all are. 
because it's been given the option, it's got TCP ports, it's got UDP ports, it's got everything else that's there. This thing's ready to go. It's talking via the modem to the outside world. That's it. UPnP is done. Modem likes it, NVR likes it, everybody's happy. So now I go to my phone. If my switch is working properly, yes it is. Do a purple reset again. So I've just got my phone onto the app and I've got it plugged into the same switch as everything else. I will, just for safety's sake, go out and then back in. So this is the app, the front screen that greets you if you've done it before. I've got my unique username and ID that's up here and I can log in from here. Now I get a lot of questions about people saying, do you need to create an account to be able to use this app? The short answer is definitely not, you don't. However, there are limitations with the free, or not the free, it's not paid, with the non-registered version. If you do a local login, you can set it up, add your cameras, do all that sort of stuff the same way that you normally would. But it's only stored in the cache on your phone and in the app itself. If something happens to that app and you have to reinstall it, there go all your settings. If you drop your phone in the ocean and have to get a new one, you're going to have to add your cameras and your NVRs and everything all over again when you do it that way. The other thing that can happen is if the app manufacturer says, oh, we've got this really cool new feature that allows us to do X. But we, to do that, we have to clear the local cache to make that happen. And so they do. And so your local login loses all its settings and you've got to re-add them again. You're getting the theme here for it? That's not a process that you want your customers to do. It's not something you want to do yourself very often. If you're a nerd like me and you play with it all the time, maybe that's not so bad. But in general, this is a bit of a pain in the neck to deal with. It can cause one other big problem too, which I've seen a few times, you may come across it. When it deletes the cache, it doesn't delete it all. And so what ends up happening is your 16 channel NVR, which was one device with 16 channels underneath it in the actual thing to swipe through, now becomes 16 individual cameras linked in there. And your device manager goes from being one nice little line to a full screen worth of crap. Reset, reboot, add it again, and off you go. Or create a login for it, and that way it reduces the possibility of all that sort of stuff happening by a lot. But certainly for me, swapping phones or changing devices, going from this to that or changing anything else over, having a central login makes it a hell of a lot easier to deal with. So for now, I'm just going to log into this. And there we go. We've got a few devices running at the moment. Um, as a very basic setup, what you would do is hit your device manager up the top. You've got the options here of device, it's a bit grayed out, but you've got device ID or IP domain. The name that's on that top line is whatever you want that to be. Could be Ben's NVR, it could be factory number three, it could be, doesn't really matter. The device ID that's on the next line, there are two ways of doing this. On our cameras and our NVRs, because yes, you can set this app up just for an individual camera if you want it to. Again, go into the camera settings, turn on UPnP, modem supports it, then I can view one camera or a couple of cameras remotely if I want to. The ID is written on the box, on the device, alongside the QR code. That QR code equals that ID number. They are exactly the same thing. It's just a shorthand method is the QR code. If you have a customer who's overseas and you've set up their NVR for them and they, you know, they can't get access to the QR code easily without printing it out or scanning it off an email or something stupid, send them the UMKS number. Just say, all right, on this page, put in Ben's NVR, UMKS, XXX, XXX, whatever the code is that's on it, admin and password, and OK, done, job's done. I've added it and it's connected and everything's good. Uh, if I show you, that's what I've done here. So there's the name rather than the QR code. I've put my username and password in and that's it. The device is there. If I want to choose by doing it the QR code instead, the QR code is too small on my screen. So I use Fantastic Paint to boost the size and I scan it and that same ID number comes back up again. They're interchangeable for each other. Username, password, job done. And now, if I had all this connected to the internet, I'd be able to view it remotely. To give you an idea of what that looks like, 
This is my home camera system in my driveway. That's it. My phone isn't connected to that. It's connected to the Telstra tower and through Telstra, through to my modem and into my NVR. And so that's a live stream of my soon to be mode driveway and area that's there. So great, simple enough. I can swipe through my cameras and everything else through the app, very simple. For those of you who've never used the app before, a few things to take note of on this page. There is a snapshot button that allows me to take a photo of whatever I'm seeing right now. And I, right next to it is the recording icon, which allows me to record a bit of video onto my phone. If I do that and I've taken that snapshot, I go back to my local photos, there it is. And now I can export that by hitting the bottom button and now it's in my photo album. So if my dogs do something stupid in the backyard and I've caught it you know, with a nice big snapshot, I can send that through to my wife and go, you won't believe what the two idiots did now. That's something very simple to do. Or if you're watching it remotely and somebody's breaking in and they're about to steal your NVR, it's nice to be able to take a few snapshots or record some footage of that happening so that you've still got a copy of it regardless of whatever happens internally, okay? So, back to my device manager. You'll notice that I have, say, demo day and demo day static here, and this is something I recommend strongly to people that use these all the time as well. The UMKS number, the QR code, and all that sort of thing, the way that that works is your NVR talks through your modem to a server that is Singapore, Hong Kong, Taiwan, wherever it is. It's Singapore, I think, our current one is talks to that server and then your phone talks to that server and they pass the information backwards and forwards to each other to say, this is where your device is. That's great if the server's up and running, which it is probably 98% of the time, if not more. Um, but there is maintenance, there are you know, power outages, there's you know, firmware updates that need to be applied to the server or whatever else goes on and the system will go down. When that happens, FSEYE will just tick over and tick over and go, no, nah, can't connect to anything because it doesn't know where your NVR is anymore. If I do something like this, though, I use my IP domain settings. I use my WAN address, my IP uh, supplied by my ISP. So your modem will have that in there. It will tell you what that IP address is. If you set that up as a static address, it's not bouncing through a server overseas anymore it's going directly to your modem and into your device. It can shorten the process significantly. So instead of having to wait for that system to go back up and there, it's going directly to another site in Australia. It could be quite simple for you. If you're down the street at the shops, it's a much quicker distance to go a kilometre back down to home through the local towers than it is to go via space to Singapore and then back down again. It's still pretty quick, but you know, this is quicker. The downside of this is that address. So most of you at home will have a WAN address, an IP address assigned by your ISP that changes. It's called a dynamic IP address. Telstra could change it right this second, next week in a month's time. You know, Aussie Broadband might assign you that one IP address for the length of your account with them. Or if your modem switches off and back on, it might have a new IP address assigned to it by your service provider. If you have a dynamic IP address from them, that will change at some point. In practice, most of the time, that's pretty static, unless things like power outages, modems, reboot, etc. So you can get away with it for a lot of time. And I do it for my home system, even though I'm on you know, uh, an IP address that changes every sort of three months or so, or whenever I reboot my modem. All I do is go looking for it, change this number that's in there, and then I've got access to it again af afterwards. For my system, that makes sense. For your customers, your clients, you might want to do that slightly differently. If you're good at this sort of stuff, then you know about things like dynamic DNSs, which is a way around this. It's essentially exchanging one server system for another server system, but they can still be, make things useful for you. You can set up things like VLANs to log in remotely and so on and so on, but through the app, having a static IP address will save you in those times when something changes or something goes down. And if you're paying $12 a month, you know, then you get your own static IP address from a lot of different service providers. Um, one quick note on that, 3G, 4G modems, can't do it. Can't get a static IP address. They have, it varies all the time. Um, so if you're trying to do it 
like my ADSL's out at the moment, so I'm running off a 4G modem at home. That IP address changes all the time. So my static one is completely useless right now. So I'm relying on the servers to be up and working for me. It's just the way that those modems talk to the network means that that address can change a lot more often than, than usual. Okay, that's the app. That's the very basics for it and how it all works. We've got guides and FAQs on our site of more of the details of this and some of the other stuff that you can do with it. But that's sort of the basics from there. If I show you a couple other little things on this live view that you may not know, there is a green button down the bottom corner and this is playback of what was happening at, well, in this case, it's midnight. You can see the bar on the bottom here. I've got green recordings that are going on. And so that's midnight this morning. If I want to go back to another day, I tap the thing up in the top right hand corner and I can go back a day or two and see what was happening uh, on the 17th at midnight as well. Connects through, buffers, and there we go. We've got uh, massive construction that happening at the back of the street. So we often got cars coming and going and turning around and the rest that's happening there for it. So that's a live view recording and I can scrub backwards and forwards through that bar at the bottom to find a different time of day or things if I'm looking for it. I can also from that recording take snapshots, take video footage and other things like that. So if I'm on a beach in Bali and I want to get a bit of footage to somebody, I can do that via my phone rather than having to go back to the NVR, plug in a USB stick and record from there. Um, very cool. If you had microphone on any of your cameras, it would also be streaming the audio back to you through your phone from that recording right now. And there's an IP camera up here with a microphone on it that you can see that on. Uh, if you have a speaker set up to your system, you know, from the output of one of these cameras that has an audio output, hook in a powered speaker to that and you can talk back through your app to the speaker at your property. So you could use it as a pseudo IP intercom if you really wanted to. Um, if you're always viewing it or you had a camera out in the factory and you wanted to tell them to stop horsing around, tap on the microphone, go, oi, get back to work and tap on it again and the speaker goes dead. If you have a microphone in there, you can listen to what's going on live as well. The, as you swipe across, you've got multi-camera views. Keep in mind that this will only work well if you have a lot of upload and download speed from your mobile and your Wi-Fi and your ADSL and whatever else you're connected to. And if you have a PTZ camera that has some ability to zoom or focus remotely or do something else, then you can do all of that through the app as well. Pretty simple. It's a bit laggy because yeah, even if I'm only a couple of kilometers down the road from home, I'm pressing a button on here, the app's got to communicate to the modem, the modem through the NVR, NVR to the camera to tell it to zoom in and out. That's not instantaneous, but as you can see, it works. So simple enough. Um, there are a couple of others here on PTZs. You can have presets and cruise positions and other things on them. So you can do all of that pretty easily. And that's actually new. I don't know what that does yet. I'll have to play around and see what I can find out. Yeah. For the app, can you remotely set off an alarm? Like if you see someone who's not meant to be there, is there a trigger for a relay? That is a good question. I know the NBR has relays. You can put relays onto them. NVR does. I don't think the app has any ability to do that. No. No, I don't think so. I've actually never been asked that before, so I'm not 100% sure, but I don't think it does. The communication's more... There's no reason why it couldn't do it. I'm guessing that if there was a miscommunication or something else, your alarm might be going off permanently or you know would trigger temporarily and not the way that you want it to yeah yeah um that's a good question though i think we'll ask the factory and see if it's something that might be able to be added or used that way um, mm. yeah definitely we tend i mean one thing i didn't i wasn't going to cover today very much is most of these have got alarm outputs and inputs on them so you can use something like a push button or a PIR to trigger this to start recording or open a gate, the read switcher goes off and it sends the command to say start recording or do something specific through it. You can use these through the smart recordings and the motion detection and other features on them to trigger those alarm outs to do something as well. That might be turn on a light, that could be triggering an alarm system or doing something else along the way. Um, I tend not to recommend using them to trigger an external alarm panel 
because these are a lot hypersensitive is probably the best way to put it. The motion detection in particular can't do much between a tree and a car and a person. There are ways of tweaking that and choosing different areas of the frame to select to only activate if you're in this area, but the wrong lighting condition, the wrong bit of movement from a tree and suddenly your alarm's going off and your neighbor's gonna kill you. So that, in that sense, isn't as useful. The IQ, the smart features and recordings, the line crossing, the object removal and those sort of things, they are more sensitive. And potentially if you're in a control environment, they will make a lot more sense. But I had a case not that long ago where they were using an object removal to trigger an alarm and it was a pallet that was on the ground. And the idea was if somebody came in and took the pallet away, that the alarm would be triggered. Problem is if they did that at night, the forklift lights that were on it were shining enough that even if they drove past, there was enough pixels that moved on the display that the motion thought that something had changed and moved and removed, so therefore it triggered the alarm even though no nobody had even touched it. So it's smart, but not very smart, if you know what I mean. So controlling the environments and things like that, using relays and switch, uh, like toggle switches, read switches, garage door sensors, PIRs and other things to trigger this is probably a much safer way to make that happen. Um, but yes, that's what we've got going on. And I'll probably stop viewing my live driveway at the moment, just in case the neighbors come home and I, I get irritated. Um, so app, recording, UPnP sort of thing, working fine. All the cameras come, uh, all the NVLs come straight out of the box, recording 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Motion detection and the rest, we've got FAQs and the rest on our site. There are a lot of options within that that I don't want to go through in huge detail today because we're already over time and I want to make sure we go and have lunch or coffees or whatever you need to, to do next. Um, there are a few general things I wanted to uh, cover as well. Um, for your, when I was talking before about DHCP and IP addresses on the network, there's one little thing that I like doing and I recommend doing, and when I log in remotely for TeamViewer support to somebody, I will often do this to make sure it's right. I will go into their network settings to their LAN settings. Yep, here we go again. And switch across to here. I will go advanced network. LAN settings, there we are. So here's my DHCP server range. So my modem is here and it can set IP addresses anywhere from .0.2 all the way up to 254. Down the bottom of this page, and again, it's different on every modem, these are my current client lists that are there, but I can reserve addresses for them. So if I want to, I can go in here and say, all right, my let's say desktop computer that's here, I can put F0, uh, actually scan this, I can choose, let's say this device, I can put all this in here and save that. Now what happens is that this camera, even though it's in the same DHCP range as everything else that's there, will always be assigned that same IP address based on its own fingerprint, its MAC address that's there. Changing that, you know, putting your NVR in that DHCP range, even if you set it statically, if something else comes along and wants that same static IP address, you end up with this lovely fight between two devices that are trying to talk over the top of each other. So using your client list or your address reservation or something similar to assign those IP addresses permanently is a great way to do it. Other ways are to move it out of the range of everything else that might be connected to it. So all your normal phones, tablets, smart TVs are all 0.1 through to say 50, put your camera system at 150. You know, stick it way up the top of the range, out of the realm of everything else. Nothing should come along to take it. But setting the IP addresses aside in here means that the DHCP guys can never choose those and use them for those device for anything else that comes along. So that's a really important thing to do for a customer's site to make sure it's reliable and solid. Um, let me see. One last little thing for you. And then please come up and ask any other questions or any other bits and pieces. Um, when you have an NVR, DVR system and you're playing around with it, using the settings, doing everything else that you want to do for it, and you change the, IP, the 
uh, password, which you should absolutely do, absolutely for security do, make sure you remember what that password is. I know that's a really simple way of saying it, but it is a real pain in the neck if you forget it. If your client loses it, if they change it and don't tell you what it is and they forget it, then the NVR, DVR has to come back to us here. We've got a technician here and one at the factory in China. They're the only people who can change that password over. We can't just send you out a master password and site and say, oh, don't do that again. We want to make sure this is secure as possible, which is the reason why we do it here and the factory does it in Taiwan. If you want to send it to Taiwan, be our guest. I'm sure the factory would be happy to do it, but you're paying shipping both ways to make that happen. So be very, very careful with the passwords that you choose. Um, some people say keep a record of it, keep it on file, do something else like that with it. Use a password manager service if that's what you choose to do. There are good and bad reasons to use all of those things for it. But in a general sense, you know, a bit of obscurity is not a bad thing. So take the password and stick it in your filing cabinet or put it on a sticker on the back of your fridge or something that, where it's a place that nobody's going to think of to find it. At least you'll know it's there if you have to go back to it. Otherwise... Bring the recorder back to us. We generally don't charge for, you know, for doing, uh, you know, changing a password back to its defaults again. If you do it four times in a week, that's when our technicians start getting irritated and might charge you $30 to make it happen. But I don't think we've ever had anybody do that so far. So uh, yeah, just, uh, there we go. And I've got some tools and things that I will show you here. My favorite one is this one. This is the low level configuration tool for all our cameras, DVRs and NVRs. From here, I can double click to choose and change any IP address that I choose. I can also preview, if I choose a camera, I can preview that camera live if it's working via the network, which this one isn't because I changed the address. If I take, uh, let's say this one. Yeah, I been stuffing around with it. But yes, preview should work from there. I can also do restores. I can set the times and other things from this software. This is the lowest level hardware, firmware, you know, right to the machine code type of level software that we have. So if you're on a network and your NVRs can't find the cameras, this software should be able to find it. If you still can't, then something's really gone wrong. Probably they're not powered, but it's here. The app is the easiest way I know of to get these things set up. And I guess that brings me into my last main point when it comes to anything to do with NVRs, cameras, or anything similar. You need to have your computer with you when you're setting one of these things up. Trying to set this thing up without a computer means you don't know really what your IP address of your modem is. You don't know what the DHCP is doing. You can't assign IP addresses through there. Phones will allow you to do some of that if you're allowed on the local network, but these apps make a lot of the job so much easier and having them on your computer with you, I mean, a $300 laptop with a Wi-Fi card is enough to do all of this programming and system setup and everything else you want to do. If you're going to be an installer for this sort of gear, it's absolutely worth having it. Or grab one of the T700 4K uh, screen recorder setups that we have. Seven inch touchscreen, 1080p screen that's on it. It can PoE for a camera. It's got LAN set up, it's got everything else you want to test through it, cable testing, etc., all in one go. They're a beast of a device to have with you if you're going to do a job like that one. If you don't want your laptop up the ladder with you, which you probably shouldn't do anyway, that test tool is going to be an invaluable thing for you. Um, I didn't do this before, but I should show you it very quickly. Um, talking cameras on our network from different manufacturers, some of them need to be activated before you do anything. So Hikvision camera and an Enview camera, guess what? They're made in the same factory, so the same software works for them. These I have already activated earlier on, but when you run this program for the first time and scan, you'll find your devices on the network and it'll say inactive. Tick the box, tick activate that's here. It'll ask you to set a password for it, set that password, and now the thing is up and running. So if I do, I think I can do that on this one. Restore default, complete restore, and I'll do this as the last thing here. I keep saying last, there's too many things that you can cover in all of this. Um, I'm also planning to run, uh, yeah, I'm also planning to run complete 
NVR set up training outside of normal hours and during normal hours, not as this kind of session, but more of a put you in front of an NVR and DVR with some cameras, with a monitor, and set it up for yourselves. Get things working, tested, working the way you expect to. You can ask me questions one on one and we'll make that a lot easier, or one on eight or 10, however many I can fit into a class. And I'm gonna deliberately mess up some of the cameras and the NVRs and DVRs to see if I can get you to work out what's wrong with it, how to fix it, how to make it better, and so on from there. I will also uh, make a mention that, yeah, this isn't gonna work on it, it's the wrong one. Um, uh, so I'll also make a mention of we have an installer list, a suggested installer list on our website. So if any of the installers out there want to get added to that so we can recommend you for CCTV or AV or TV antennas or anything similar, let one of our guys know, you know send through whatever credentials and things you have so that we can add you to the list as people that we recommend. Um, obviously when we're recommending you we sort of, we expect that you have a default level of knowledge for it and that you solve a lot of your own problems and we try to look after you on prices and everything else that we can. But if, um, you know, we don't want to sort of add everybody to the list if they've never done one of these systems in their life. And I would say, oh, this isn't gonna do it for me today. Um, I would say that the best way of learning any of these systems is to have one for yourself. The cheapest little four channel NVR, I think they're, uh, 269 or 299 without a hard drive that's at retail much cheaper for trade and for any of you guys that want to have one of these for yourself to monitor your van or you or your home or anything else like that to get used to it talk to our guys talk to me about it and we'll see what we can do to help you out on it but I know that there's no substitute for actually having one of these things and using it for yourself um, I have a mixture of Uniview cameras and DOS cameras at my house. I have some 4K cameras, some 2 meg ones. I have some Starviz ones. I have some generics things. I have all sorts of other crap that's there. And I get used to playing around with it all so I know what I'm talking about some of the time to be able to tell you guys what I'm talking about some of the time. There we go. There's my, my thing has become inactive. Um, that's the... It's... Yeah, at the moment it's not doing anything. It doesn't know how to talk to anything else. It doesn't know how to work. I hit the activate button. I choose a password for it. And Hikvision is going to judge me for my weak password skills. Hit OK. Camera is now activated. Network is wrong. So I go to my edit network parameters and I go oh, 0 0.145. dot 0.1. Put my password in again at the bottom. If I put that in correctly, there it is. And you can see now it's got the right details and configuration, everything else that's there. If I go over to my NBR. What did I say? That was 145. Sometimes this takes a little bit of time before it comes live on here. Ah, there it is. There's my camera, but I did actually jump one thing and this is something that's particular to the on, uh, sorry, to Hikvision cameras. Um, uh, this one, it's this one up here. I want this, I think. Oh no, that's on the old address. Okay, let's do it this way instead. Um, yes, fine. Fine, this is the thing. I've already selected this and turned this on. Hikvision cameras in general do not come with OnViv switched on. So I've told you earlier that Hikvision cameras connect to DOS NVRs without too much trouble. This is the thing that gives people trouble because that Hikvision has it turned off by default. They prefer all their own protocols. It makes it easy for them. Simple. If you want to make it work on anybody else's system, enable it, add a user, admin, operator, or media, depending on what you're trying to do with it. Put a username and password in, save it, next. And then what it means is, oh, let's do this via the web interface, because that way I don't have to try and reboot things again. 121. Or am I on 122? 
thought I'd save some time, but I think I've actually made it longer. I'll do that. Go back to my search page for it. You'll see that it's already enabled for OnVIF, which means that I can select it here. I can go into this down the bottom here. I can put my username and my weak password. One, two, three. Into the device, save, set, there it is. There is my device on the network. It takes a little while, typically. I might have to reboot it to make it happen. But did I get that? You know what? I didn't save that, did I? Um, essentially, it's just put username and password in there for it. Make sure the ports are right. All good. And then the camera comes up and you can record to it and do whatever else you want to do. And remember the limitations of not all your channel parameters are available. Hikvision has specific technology and things built into their cameras. Could be number plate recognition or whatever else it does. Those won't be available to the NVR. The NVR doesn't know about it. Hikvision does. Go into the Hikvision, do them directly and off you go from there. Okay. Simple enough, and I'll leave you with a lovely view of the ceiling and your happy, smiling faces, telling me that I've done a wonderful job and none of you are asleep, which is a good start. Um, yeah, please come on up if you want to have a look at some of the other cameras, ask me any specific questions or job problems or other things that you've come across. Um, as I think I said earlier on, I'll be rewriting the manual. I'm most of the way through it, but I need to format it properly. Once that's done, it'll be on the FAQs and linked to on the website, so hopefully make things a bit easier for you as well. And as far as extra IP network training and the rest goes, come up and see me. I'll scribble your name down on my list, and if you want it, when I set it up, you're more than welcome to come along and have a bit of a play with anything we might have, okay? Thank you very much.